Welcome back to uh, episode three. I'll check the sound here. It's doubling me up. Hmm. Alright, well, let's see how that goes. So, I left off last time on the Travelers of Reverend Ulifur Eagleson at chapter 20, and we're on to chapter 21. About Marseille itself, the dress of the inhabitants, both men and women, and about my travels from there. <clears throat> Marseille is built about a rounded fjord, which is so narrow. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, the music got too loud there. Put some Christmassy tunes on. Let me begin again. Marseille is built around uh, about a rounded fjord, which is so narrow that I think it must be less than 40 fathoms wide across the fjord mouth. In the channel are four brick towers, between which are strung very strong iron chains. Long iron points stick out from these chains so that ships or boats cannot sail in or out of there in any way. On the right side of the fjord mouth stands the castle of that place. Three large tree trunks are fastened there in the water, forming a long floating boom, closed at one end but open at the other, which are locked to the castle. The harbor is located inside this log boom and can contain at least 100 ships. Marseille is a large port town with many buildings that are five and in some places six stories high. The whole is protected by cannons much larger than any I've seen anywhere else in my miserable travels. No one can pass out or in without permission of those inside the castle. The men and women in that town fear the same, wear the same fashion of clothes as in Italy. They do not lay quite as much stress on dressing, but they are very clean. The people are dark-haired and white-skinned. In that town I saw this I saw on the St. Andrew's Mass a group of 1,400 women who walked their vow walk, as is their custom, to St. Andrew's Church, which stood to the eastward, close to the town, in a cloister. Whether it was a nunnery or a monastery, I did not know. There's a note here. The uh, feast day of St. Andrew is November 30th. This host of women was most pleasant to look upon. They all had linen aprons, white as snow, which they drew together in their belts and which were woven in such a way as to come together in the mid-back. Their order of walking in this procession was that first they walked side by side, two, then three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and each row was wider than the one before it. But there was no row of more than ten. Now about my leaving there. We went from that town on Christmas Eve, according to my reckoning, and then we waited outside for two days, for our captain. Two other Dutch ships also waited for him, since he was afraid to tell uh, fr a friend to them all, and he had the biggest ship and was the, and with the most cannons. On the third morning, twelve ships left in one fleet together. Only three of them were armed. The ship I was on had twenty-six cannons and eight stein, stein sticky, which is the literal meaning of stein sticky is stone pieces, but sticky in this context is a loan word from the Danish for cannon. Stein sticky refers to cannons that fired stone balls rather than iron or lead shot. In other European languages, these weapons were known variously as pat patareros, 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 pedreros, pedreros, or petereros. I mean, who cares? Why'd they write that there? All these terms derive from Spanish piedra or Portugal or Portuguese pedra, both meaning stone. Petereros were generally small size breech loading. It continues the next page. As opposed to muzzle loading. Swivel guns. They were fairly common in the Reverend Old First Time. Another ship had 24 cannons and 6 stein sticky. The third ship had 12 smaller cannons. Oh, that's the end of that sentence. <laughs> There's an image here of uh, Marseille. Looks very nice. Can't really show you though. 
We had the best wind, wind for nine days. On the tenth day of Christmas, during the best weather of all, we sailed through the Straits of Gibraltar, as they call it. The captains and crew had great anxiety because Barbary pirates normally lurk there. There is a deadly en en enmity between Spanish and the Dutch, and theref therefore we sailed as close as possible to the Barbary coast. After that, we did not see land until we came close to England from the north on the thir 20 23rd of January. When, th uh, when then we sailed along for three days. One night we almost breached on a scary because we then had a little bad wind. Eleven days before, Pals Palsdug, Palsdug, uh, eleven days before Palsdager, Dager, uh, the 25th of January, I lost that night my vest which I had washed and hung in the ship's ropes. It says here, Palsdager is Paul's Day, a religious holiday in Iceland. He goes on, the crew unwittingly clambered over it and knocked it off. I thus did not have anything to cover my uh, cover me except an old shirt and the breeches in which I had been captured. Soon thereafter, I lost my hat off my head because of the weather. Then my honest friend, Captain Caritas, gave me another hat, which was small, and a steersman gave me an old pullover, and I bought another myself. <clears throat> Wherever men travel, there are robbers, both on sea and land, so we must trust in God's mercy. Murder and burning are customarily done in these countries. At sea, robbery and killing are common to hear of. On our voyage, we twice encountered two pirate ships, but they left us alone. On the 8th of February, we came close to Holland, though so close to Holland that we first saw towers of the towns. The sea was not more than four fathoms deep, and therefore Holland will always be invincible because the sea shoals so gradually from the shore. There were more than 100 stranded ships there, stuck immovably. They must unload their cargo from the ship for more than three sea miles from the shore. For every 60 tons of cargo carried uh, to land, the local authorities were given $30 as a duty. It took two days to unload the ship, and then we were, uh, we removed to Enkhazen, and I came to Holland. Four. Enkhazen is in Reverend Olfander... Ulfinger, Ulfer's rendering of Enkhuizen. Enkhuizen is located on what is now uh, Isilmir, a large, shallow, 16 to 20 foot artificial freshwater lake reclaimed from the sea in the 1930s. In Reverend Olfer's days, this body of water would have been the Zoeter, Zoeter Sea, salt water instead of fresh, but just as shallow. His observation that the sea was not more than four fathoms deep is reassuringly accurate since four fathoms equals 24 feet. In the 1620s, Enkhuizen had a population of about 21,000, and in importance as a port was second only to Amsterdam. Ah, you, good gods, man, I can tell you of God's promise, which he gives to those whom he has mercy upon. Do not be afraid. I have saved you and called you by your name. You are mine, and when you cross the waters, I will be with you, so that the flood will not drown you. Isaiah 41, 1. And so ends chapter 21, and now we're on chapter 22, about what happened to me in Holland, and about that country and its places. When I came into the town on that big ship on which I had been traveling, uh, the town of Enkhuizen, my good captain Caritas came back on board and gave me further permission to have food on it as long as I should be there. He said he would look after things so that I could easily come to Denmark. Then he added to that help, uh, then he added to that help he had already given me so far, both in France and on the way, by giving me two good shirts, although they were old and also leggings and shoes. Before Christmas, in France, he had given me one of his frock coats, which cost twelve guilders, equaling five dollars in their reckoning. It says here, the daler Reverend Olfer refers to as, again, as the Danish Rieks, Rieksdaler. The exchange rate he gives is in line with other sources for this period. This coat was all I had for covering at night, day, and, among, and along with a large hat, like a monk's hat. <laughs> it's the little things, you know. When I had been four days in the town on this big ship... I became 
short of food for myself and a cabin boy who had been kept aboard the ship because he had stolen food and sold it for money for himself. Then I had to leave the ship and plan to search for Captain Carita's house, but I did not have success in this because the town was so big. I mean, it had 21,000 people on it. I came, upon, uh, uh, I came upon one house where there was a Danish man and a Norwegian woman, and there I got a room for myself. I think that was the 23rd of February. I was there in that house till the 16th of March, on very poor provisions because my purse was so light. During that time, I traveled to Hornstader, which is uh, Hurn, a port town located about 12 miles west, uh, west by southwest of Enkhuizen. All right, let me go on here. During this time, I traveled to Horn because I was owed, uh, I owed there a sailor of one of the ship's nine stoiver, that is 18 shillings or skillings. Then I returned to Inkhuizen. Now about the countryside and the towns. The Dutch countryside is such that wherever I went, as far as I could tell, it was man-made. All around the land are poles a uh, pole fence is sunk down into the seabed, made of a tree whose wood becomes like stone in the sea. These stones bought from other countries are placed. Oh, then stones bought from other countries are placed against the fences. Clay, which looks like peat here in Iceland, is then shoveled over the rocks. Seen from a distance, the land is lower than the sea outside. There are, four, there are windmills throughout the whole country that draw up from the land the water which seeps in from the sea. These windmills work night and day uh, when the wind blows. There are so many that in between them there are, is no more distance than a race course. Here it is said that if the wind could not blow for a month, then the country would be underwater. Probably still true to this day. Many of the buildings in the towns uh, which I saw there were very well built. Normally, they are no more than three or most four, uh, most four stories high. Some of them were painted outside and with, uh, outside and in with all di kinds of different colors, and many of them are decorated with great, great skill. Ships lay at anchor on canals amongst the houses and not outside, except when cargo is loaded or unloaded. Where the Dutch first see a sandy spit or shallow, shallow shoal, they shovel out a big outlet and throw the clay from the sea bottom up and down both sides. After a year, the clay is hard as stone. The towns which I visited were built on such ridges of clay. Across the canals that are thus formed in these towns are surprisingly huge bridges made with great skill. Some of these can be drawn up and down in order to let ships pass. On both sorts, horses are ridden and carriages driven. To maintain these canals, ten men from the town are normally retained. They go along these canals in shallow boats with poles in their hands. They wear boots which come up to their armpits. At the lower end of their poles, they have what looks like wood cards with five or six feet, uh, five or six teeth, wide teeth made of iron. They dredge the canals and place mud or clay that comes out wherever the town's authorities tell them. After a year, it is as hard as stone, he says again, and then new houses are built. And so the towns expand year after year, with their dates being marked on each house door. That's kind of interesting. And uh, now we're on to chapter 23, which he entitles, About my travels in Flayland, the island of Vleeland, Holland, and to Kronenberg, Kronberg on the island of Zeeland, Denmark, and my reception there. On the 16th of March, I got my passage on a ship with another Dutch captain through the inter intercession of my good friend and helper, Captain Caritas, who I have mentioned before, of course. As for the people of Holland, in all respects, both in appearance and conduct, they are unlike any other. They are humane and benevolent, particularly, particularly the sailors. Nowhere else are the women as good looking, for the Dutch women can be said to be very beautiful. The religion of these people, I think, is mixed. The captain with whom I uh, went from Holland was named Ulf Rakheit, Rakheit. I spent 23 days with him on his ship. I was also with him in Flayland for two days. Flayland, he's referring to Vleeland, which is one of the West Frisian Islands, a chain of islands. Running parallel to the Dutch coast, Vleeland is situated just north of what was then Zoidersee and now 
uh, and is now the artificial freshwater lake of Isselmeyer. All right, very nice. So I was, all, I was also in this town with him in Fleeland for two days. In that town, which is called Roll Beer. And it says here, it is difficult to know exactly which town he's referring to because that doesn't seem to have existed. In that land, I saw no grassy plants, nothing except red sand. I'm sure he's embellishing. 65 ships sailed together from Flayland, most of them headed to Denmark to buy oxen, which during the springtime do not cost much. We sailed from Flayland on the, on the 22nd and had very fair wind and came towards Jutlandskagi, the Jutland the Peninsula, on the 25th. On the 26th, we sighted the Swedish Kingdom. I came to... So they did it. They, they went around in a day. Pretty crazy. I came to Kronoburg in Denmark and felt almost as if I had arrived home to Iceland. Kronoburg is Reverend Ulfer's rendering of Kronborg, which is located in present-day Helsinger, Helsingor, on the northeastern tip of Zealand Island, on the sound between Zealand and Sweden. Kronborg was built in the early 15th century to control access to the Baltic Sea. The sound is only about 2.5 miles or 4 kilometers wide at that point. By Reverend Ulfer's day, the original medieval fortress had been extensively renovated, Helsingor is the inspiration for Elsinore in Shakespeare's Hamlet, the Kron uh, and Kronberg for the castle. Directly when I came into the town, I met there an honest man, Jakob Peterson, who had earlier been a sheriff for seven years in the Westman Islands. He took me at once into his house, where his wife and children were. After a meal, he was called to attend the funeral of a merchant, and see him to his grave. I went with him there and heard the funeral sermon. Later that night, I was invited with him and a guest to the uh, of the pri uh, I was invited with him as a guest of the priest who had preached the funeral sermon. That man asked me many things, but his name I have forgotten. That night, this same priest invited several men to get uh, to a gathering, which I and Jacob thought he did because he hoped they would have pity on me, but it did not help. He himself, however. Gave me a, do a dollar and a good old hat. Although they had many children, Jacob and his wife gave me an old shirt, a worn priest's collar, and a new small postilla, post book of sermons. Now it is written by the prophet that Nebur Nebuzar Nebuzaradan gave him conscience, money, and sent him away. All right. Jeremiah thirty nine thirteen. Is that accurate, Bible guys? I don't know. And that's the end of chapter 23. We're on to chapter 24. So I'll check how many chapters we got left. There's not much left here. Almost done. I think, uh... There's only chapter 27, so we only have three more to go. Including that, uh, plus this one. About my arrival in Copenhagen... My good reception and donations from honest men, learned and not. On the 20th of March, I came to Copenhagen, and as soon as I got there, I was received as if I were an angel. The man who was closest to me and most concerned with my well-being was an honorable man named Jens Hesselberg, who had been a king's man on the Westman Islands for some time. A king's man, as noted here, was a combination sheriff and tax collector. That same day, he brought me to, uh, brought me to the Compagnet and told the honest Icelandic ship owners about me. And here it says Compagnet is short for uh, Der Islandski Fero Feroisk och Nordlandski Kompagni, the trading company of Iceland, the Faroe Islands, and the North Northland. Established in 1620. So I guess it's kind of like the Hudson's Bay Company, but for the Danes and their possessions outside of Denmark. They took me into their hands and, at his request, gave me free board for seven and a half weeks. Also clothing for Easter, which they themselves had made for me and paid for. Either themselves or my honest uh, Jens, which is the guy he's talking about. 
On the first day I came there, I was given several small coins, exactly two dollars, by some of the Dutch question mark sailors who knew me. Thanks, glory and be, uh, thanks and glory be to God always. On the fifth of April first, on the fifth of April, <laughs> I, poor man, was invited along with Master Thorlekur Skulason to a company of guests at Doctor Hans Reisen's house. Doctor Hans Reisen must have been Hans Poulsen Reisen, who was the Sjaland Biscop, the Bishop of Sjaland, uh, i.e. Zealand, on the island of which Copenhagen is located, the leader of the Danish and also of the Icelandic Church. Here I was asking, I was asked many things by him about all the countries which I had been to, including Iceland. He gave me a daler. On the 8th of April, I got my opportunity to see His Most Gracious Majesty, the noble born King Christian of Denmark and Norway, the fourth of that. Uh, of that name with the royal title. The grace, this gracious lord seemed to be humble and gentle with his subjects. That same day, I saw his nor noble born son, the king, the honorable Christian V. During this month, I was invited to many gatherings along with many guests by honorable men, and I often played the goodness of many kind, I often enjoyed the goodness of many kind men, especially the Icelandic merchants. And so I acquired in that most respectable place nearly 18 dalers. But because of my distress and poorness, I had to spend them all. To show my gratitude before God and all good men, I want to name those who helped me in that honorable town. The first one who gave, me, uh, gave to me was a merchant who sails to the Faroe Islands with support of my honest... Wait, who was a merchant who sails to the Faroe Islands with support of my friend... Honest friend at Jens Heselberg, which is now spelled differently here. The next was an Icelander named Bjarni Orms Ormsson, who had once held authority over the Westman Islands. He gave me two dalers and helped me in the other things. In other things, the next was an honorable woman who had been uh, held authority in the Westman Islands. She gave me two dalers as well and offered me food and drink free during my stay in the town. Mats Hansen, an honest merchant from North Iceland then in Copenhagen, gave me six dalers of that money which the Honorable Priest from North, uh, which the Honorable Priest from North, uh, North Iceland, the Reverend Thorstein Itlugasen and uh, Bjarni Gamlison had given as a pension to Icelandic priests in Denmark, for which the Lord himself will reward them. Also, one of those Honorable Priests, whose name was Mr. Martin, gave me two dalers. A schoolmaster gave me two dalers, and an Icelander who had been brought up in the Westman Islands also gave me a daler. I think this will prove the truth of what I said. In the royal town, many good things are done. In Copenhagen, there were many fine and masterly preachers. God be thanked. And there was also fine, fine order in all things. Also, nowhere was there better beer drunk or better food cooked, and nowhere as comfortable uh, a bed as there, wherever I came to. About the town and the buildings in it, I do not need to write because many good men have been there and know it very well. The town, though, was a sad and sorrowful, was in a sad and sorrowful condition because of the war, the Thirty Years' War. May it please God, because his, of his love of mankind, to stop the fighting and to show grace and mercy upon our king and all his noble-born house to strengthen and support him. All victories come from God and can be... Read as can be read in the Bible, Genesis 4, Exodus 17, Deuteronomy 2, John 11. And that was chapter 24, now on to chapter 25. About my complaint, which I had to relate to everyone, and about how I was incapacitated by my sorrows, and about what, was, and about what sorrow and pain may do for us. My dear beloved reader and good friend, I must confess that, because of the loss of my wife and children, which God himself heals, I cannot talk or write as I want or should about our merciful Lord the King, the Prince, the Son of the King, or the town of uh, the town of Copenhagen, the Lords there, the preachers there, or whatever else I saw and heard there. During the time I spent in Denmark, I got to know this, how the sorrowful the events of the war had gone, and the great loss of property which the Crown had suffered. Many, uh, my sorrow became too great because then all my hope, all my hope was lost which was that I would get some support, ransom money there, so that I would buy free my wife and children. 
and you notice here, under King Christian the Fourth, Denmark had entered the Thirty Years' War in 1624. In August 1626, a little more than a year and a half before Reverend Olf Olafur's visit to Copenhagen, the Danes suffered a major defeat at Luther am Berenberg, just south of what was now Hanover, Germany. As a result, the royal coffers were seriously depleted and the king gave Reverend Olafur no ransom money. There, uh, I was always so optimistic, for it, for it could well have happened if everything had gone well for our king. And that proverb which had proved true to me, which is widely common among people, that seldom is a great grief alone. But the will of God decides everything. My choice in these matters, in the mournful days of distress, is none else than to flee to the Lord and still hope for his mercy, both for me and my family, and those and all others who have walked or will walk the path of distress and adversity. The Holy Spirit may be called the Eternal Father, for I believe that he will not remove his fatherly heart from his children, although he still punishes them, because the cross is the load which he lets the children bear for the well-being of themselves and others, because the people who are God's children are surely resigned to that cross, which not only can be seen from the text clearly, but it can obviously be seen from the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, the martyrs, and all the saints and examples of holiness. About this, King David says, The righteous man may suffer much, but the Lord saves them from all. Psalm 34, 19. And Christ himself says, He who wants to follow me must deny himself and take the cross on himself every day and walk my road. The scribes and painters who depict the nature of the animals write that when the swan is sick and has come close to death, his songs are of the greatest beauty, but my nature is not that way. Unfortunately, I let myself get distressed, although God treats me as he is wont to do uh, with his children, which is for my own and others' good. Firstly, God lays the cross of suffering upon us so that his blessed name should be praised, for when against human reason he helps us again, as he has done for me, people see clearly how to know. Clearly had to know his existence, his love, faith, yes, and omnip omnipotence. Secondly, the cross lies on the faithful so that they shall not think that they are innocent. As the prophet says, I will punish you with mercy so that you do not think that you are free of guilt. Thirdly, God lays the cross on Christians in order to test them, to see if they, regardless of whether they are doing well or badly, still want to love God with all their hearts and live under the cross. I perceive all this, but, though I am in great weakness, my singing voice, quote, which I have trained and tamed in times of sorrow, remains the same, which perhaps should not be. But I imitate this, not the swan, but the raven, which cries the same way when he is crushed and lay dying, as he does when he is still alive. May God have, my, may God have pity on me, a wretched sinner. I ask Almighty God for patience because it can beat sorrow to death, since long-lasting sorrow brings no reward except for that which is bad, and therefore I want to raise my head and heart and think that God is the only one who both creates men and rules them, and has the power and can always give consolation with joy after the burden of the cross. As King David tells me, wait for the Lord. Also St. Paul says, in our times of temptation, we tell ourselves that suffering gives patience. Romans 5.3 Now to, on to chapter 26. Two more to go. Oh. About my voyage from Copenhagen to Iceland and how I was received when I came there. I spent seven and a half weeks in that highly respected town of Copenhagen. There, where I had room, my, uh, I had a room, my food, and a drink at a cost of 19 dalers for two meals a day during the time I was there. On the 4th of May, I went from Copenhagen to Kronenberg and stayed there with Jakob Pedersen till the 24th. Then I boarded again a ship, again with the Dutch, with whom I sailed to the Westman Islands. I was at Kronenberg till the 6th of June because at that time the weather was constantly stormy from the north. Thereafter, we sailed with fair wind, 42 ships in a fleet. 
among which were 17 ships headed for Iceland. There were 31 days on that voyage, since we did not get even one day of fair wind. On the 13th of June, all these ships had to take shelter in a small bay called Flickery, and there we spent five days. It says here, it's not altogether clear why the convoy had to spend five days at Flickery, southwest of Kristiansand on the Norwegian coast. Uh, bad weather is the reason implied in this text, but it might have been that the ships had to stop there to pass through customs. There I visited a, f uh, a few farmsteadings, and I very much like my stay there. On the 17th day of that month, we went off from there with a mild wind from the east. We were driven off course towards Scotland, and so the Orkneys, and so to the Orkneys on the 27th. We came in sight of Iceland on the 4th of July and on the 6th to the Westman Islands. When I came there, the poor people received me as if I had been their own best friend returned again from death. Some of those honest men and women proved themselves to be kindly and generous. My poor daughter and the honest Oder Petterson took me in and cared for me. Oh, so you had a daughter left. This is the name of Oder Petterson mentioned in Klaus Eilfsson's report who stood upon the Halm, the mountain that overlooked the harbour in Hamey, and watched the events of the Corsair raid unfold. He was a captain on one of the fishing boats operating out of Hamey. In 1636, his boat sank and he drowned. That same fishing season, three fishing boats sank in the waters around Hamey. Altogether, 45 men drowned. Among them was Eilfer Sol Selmanson, the husband of Gurther Siemens' daughter whose letter to him from Algiers appears in the letter section. Oder Einersen was one of two bishops in Iceland at the time. His seat was at Skauholt in South Iceland. On the seventh day of that month, I went to the mainland and met there my beloved fellow neighbors, relatives, and good friends, who received me with complete joy and did everything they, for me that they could so much that I cannot write at all. On the ninth day of that month, I was able to meet with the most honest bishop, Oder Anderson, and his honorable wife, who joyfully took me in as if I had been their own true son, whom they had got back from death. I left there with, uh, I left there with kind gifts of money and good support. God should always be praised by all people, but good men should also be thanked by, by a man in great need. The Reverend Giz the Odison and his honorable wife, the Reverends Snyborn Stephenson, uh, Stephenson, Jan Sigurdsson, and Jan Bergson, also Erlander Ausmundsen, Thorleifer Magnusson, and later the Kingsman Gisli Haukanar Haukanarsson, and his honorable wife Margaret uh, from Braithatunga. Braithatunga. And my in-laws and relations, all these people were very kind and generous to me. God opens the hearts of men and showers mercy upon those who most need it. All good gifts come from the Father in heaven. Uh, fa Father, for, our Father in heaven above. That's the end of that chapter. Chapter 27. About the comfort and consolation that we get from the words of God. He tells us to pray for help and promises us promises us a hearing, and of this we have examples. How and for what to whom we should pray, and to whom we should call out, is given us in Scripture, Matthew 6, Luke 18. There the Lord Christ gives us the parable of the unrighteous judge and the imploring widow, and afterwards says the truth to himself. Says the truth himself. Hear, hear what the unrighteous judge saith. Shall not God avenge his own elect? which cry day and night unto him, through uh, though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. How then can a broken-hearted, sorrowful man not feel joy that the Lord is so merciful to all who need help? As David too says, Psalms 134-45, Plutarch writes uh, this way about King Demetrius, that he lets a petition of his subordinates fall into the flowing water so that he would not have to answer them. The world is a merciless, cruel place to its children when they are most in need, but heavenly charity is always available to those who pray to the Lord in the name of Jesus. I can affirm with examples 
that God certainly wants to answer our prayers when we pray as he wants us to. When, he, when we pray as, we, as he wants us to. We have enough pledges and promises. Praise shall be God, both in the Old and New Testament. Implore me and pray for your distress. I am with you and in your I am with you in your distress, and you want to be free from it. Christ Himself confirms this with a simple oath that God wants you to hear, wants to hear the prayers of all those who call upon Him. Verily, I tell you that when we pray, whether it is for ourselves or for others, we should remember that God has, in His own words, promised to hear our prayers. Therefore, He can do nothing else than as he promised. All men are liars, and their words may fail sometimes, but the Lord's words are true. He keeps his promise. Look at the old examples and mark them well. In them, nobody is chided who has prayed to God. Moses' prayer was so strong that he, it not only parted the Red Sea and overcame uh, the Amalekites, 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 but overcame God himself so that he did not destroy the hard-tempered people of Israel in his anger. The prayers of the three men of the furnace took the power from the fire. Yes, God has the most generous hand, has a most generous hand, much more, much more generous than we have the tongue, the mouth, or the hearts to know how to desire. Abraham desired nothing of God but that Ishmael could live, but received an answer from God that his wife should give birth to a young son, with whom the Lord wanted to establish a covenant with his seed after him. Therefore, should Ishmael not only live after his conception, but also be blessed and grow and reproduce. Solomon, Solomon desired wisdom from God, and God not only fulfilled his wish, but rather gave him so much wisdom and judicious heart that is, equal never existed, either before or since. Yes, God gave him that which he did not pray for, which is which was wealth and honor, and he had no equal among kings. The prodigal son got more than what he desired. Upon this and similar examples and God's promises, we should with courage walk towards the chair of mercy, so that we may receive both mercy for ourselves and others after God's word. That's the end of uh, that segment, and uh, there are some letters I'll go through because, you know, why not? And, uh, they might be of interest. So it says here, the author of uh, this version, the text of the travels finishes at this point, but we know the end of the story from other sources. After his return, Reverend Olford continued to live on Hamie. In 1636, 35 of the enslaved Icelanders were finally ransomed. 27 of these eventually returned safely to Iceland. Among this group was Re Reverend Olafur's wife. The two of them had nearly three full years together before she died at the age of 75, on March 1st, 1639. Reverend Olafur and his wife never saw any of their abducted children again. wonder what happened to them. Maybe the son got put into the Janissaries? Got his balls cut off? That's what they did to those guys. That sucks. Letters. A number of letters concerning the Tirkjernith, the Turkish Corsair raid, July 1627, have survived. Most were written by captives and sent from the, bar uh, from the Barbary to family and friends back in Iceland. One letter is a chronicle of the raid pieced together through the eyewitness accounts uh, of people who managed to evade the capture. We have placed this one first in the series. Not only do these letters provide a valuable source of added detail, both about the Turk underneath itself and about the conditions of the Barbary, they also give modern readers a compelling first-hand glimpse into the human cost of the event. First, uh, ver first one's from Klaus Eilfsson. Let's see how long it is here. Oh, jeez. Uh, appears to be 10 pages. That's not too bad. <clears throat> Don't want to spend too much time on this. Maybe I'll just read this one and then call it a, call it a thing. Or maybe a little longer. The Chronicle of Klaus Eilfsson. Vasif Tech? Hello, Donna Watson. Just saw your comment. The Chronicle of Klaus Eilfsson, a member of the Logreta, uh, the legislature of the Icelandic Parliament, 
concerning the incursions that the Turks made in the Westman Islands from the 17th uh, to the 19th of July, 1627. An interesting thing, too, is that Iceland had this law on the books, I think until 2005, that said uh, a Turk could be killed on sight if they were seen in Iceland. And, uh, you know, it makes you wonder if that would have been legal to kill a Turkish guy <laughs> up until that point. <coughs> So he says, Of the origins of the Turkish expedition, I cannot myself accurately or truthfully write, but some of those who escaped ca captivity maintain that two lords of the Turkish Empire made a bet with each other, one wagering against the other that it would not be possible to get even the smallest stone out of Iceland, much less a man. Because of this wager, the expedition was prepared and equipped, and twelve ships were sent to Iceland to capture as many people as possible and bring them back unharmed. For it is said that if even one infant, uh, it is said that even one infant could fetch as much as three hundred dalers in Algeria. When the fleet reached Iceland, it, dis it dispersed. Dispersed. Two ships arrived at the east at these fjords and stopped at Djupvogur in Berfjordr Fjord. There, uh, they were seen late during the day. One cruised the harbor and quickly captured a merchant ship, putting the Danish crew in fetters and taking everything they thought to be useful. The crew of this other ship. Uh, the crew of the other ship went inland to the farmhouses with great noise and wickedness. The first person they encountered was a young man. They took him at once and bound him and left him lying there. Then they captured other people, both men and women, driving them like sheep uh, driven, to, uh, driven to the pen. Uh, just if you don't know much about Iceland, there's lots of sheep there. Those who could not walk, the wounded or the weak, they, uh, the crippled or blind, they struck down and killed because those Turkish bloodhounds could never sate their desire for blood of the innocent, <laughs> they coursed like dogs and wild or wild beasts and came to the uh, way, came all the way to Adilir, which uh, is much more than Icelandic Thingmanlaith, uh, much more than an Icelandic Thingmanlaith, uh, from where they first came to shore. So they came way inland, like 14 kilometers, I believe. Oh, sorry, 37.5 kilometers. That's pretty deep, back then. It is reliably reported that they captured and brought to their ship many people, both young and old, together. But the young man whom they first took and bound there lay there until they went to sea again. They then sliced open his forehead and pulled his scalp down over his eyes and slashed his buttocks. What the hell? It's, uh, it's noted here, this bizarre violent assault uh, on a young man the Corsairs had already missed or trussed up seems senseless. In the heat of the chase, so to speak, the Corsairs behaved savagely, but this was securely, a securely bound captive. A healthy young man would have represented a valuable commodity. The whole Corsair, enter Corsair enterprise in Iceland, after all, was based on taking captives to sell into slavery at a profit. This is how the manuscript reads. However, no doubt there was at the time details that explained why the Corsairs brutalized the young man in this way, or why those Icelanders who reliably reported this event felt compelled to say it the way they did, but it is unlikely we shall ever be able to uncover them. There is no mention anywhere of whether the young man survived this ordeal. I would probably doubt that he did. Maybe he did. He would have been bald from then on. When the Turks returned to the ship with their captives, they took the local Danish merchant, stripped him of his clothes, made him put on old and an old and filthy shirt, and put him in the irons. They also fettered the other Danish people who lay that way for seven days. Then they gave the merchant a bad and graceless sweater to wear and released him from the irons. After the Turks had done all this, another one of their ships arrived. This ship, which was crewed by no more than 30 men, had that, at that point gained nothing. The first group of Turkish pirates agreed to take on uh, this new company, but only on the condition that the newcomers sail their ship. Which was an older ship, into the harbor first, and so receive any shot, whether it would be uh, in the Westman Islands or elsewhere. And if that ship was sunk, the first group of pirates agreed to have their own ship nearby so that the survivors could be rescued. But the third ship, which was the Admiral's, should sail south of the islands and put ashore uh, there all the raiders. When these Turkish murderers came abreast of Eyjafjallajökull, the great glacier, they surprised an English fishing vessel with its lines out and captured nine sailors. And it says, 
Okay, so they pronounce it Eyjafjallajökull. Refers to both the glacier and the volcano under the glacier. I have been there myself. It's very nice. Definitely recommend. They spoke calmly to the captain, however, and they said they would give him his men back if he agreed to show him the way to the harbor at the Westman Islands. He agreed to this, having little enough choice, and they set their course. They reached the Westman Islands early in the day and stayed off, uh, stayed off the shore until evening. Around 6 o'clock, they wanted to set course directly for the harbor, but one of the nine fishermen who had been captured, an Icelander named Thorstein, said that he would he could show the Turkish captain a better approach, which was to go th with all his host of men to the south of the island, where he could point out a way to come ashore safely. The Danish merchant on the Westman Islands had by this time become aware of the presence of the Turkish ships. He set a watch every night on the islands and ordered that all cannons should be cleaned and loaded and ready. He gave every able man a gun, and so the people were ready to defend the harbor. Once the Danish merchant realized that the Turkish pirates had snuck around southwards of the island instead of entering into the harbor, he rode out on a horse to see if he could make out what they intended to do. When he came to the shore, he saw the Turks were, uh, were in a great hurry to launch three boats full of people, but which what seemed to him to be no less than 200 men at least. Seeing all this, the merchant sent a messenger in haste to the captain of the merchant ship, instructing him to come with muskets and men to prevent those pirates from making land. The Turks first tried to land at what was called Kopavik. They did not trust themselves to that shore, however, because of the steep hill and the rocks above, and also because they saw people roving there. The Turks then rowed all the way to the Brimerth, as it is called, and that is... Oh, wait, this just says he's describing uh, Tahami, which makes sense. The Westman Islands, the big one. Uh, the merchant was already there on his horse, and with a few men also had come south with him. Oh, and with a few men who had also come south with him, ready to receive the pirates. Some of the men were panic-stricken, however, seeing the awful crowd of pirates on their way to the island, all the way to the land. These men started to scatter to their wives and children in order to get away to safety. Get them away to safety. As the murderous pirates drew near the rocky shore at Bremerth, the merchant fired a musket at their forward boat. The pirates only shouted wickedly at him and leapt from their boats onto the strand, one after another. Then they all charged towards the merchant, Lauritz Baga. When he saw this, the Danish merchant could wait no longer. He leaped onto his horse and galloped back towards the Danish merchant houses. As he came onto the road, he encountered his captain, Henrik Thomason. It seemed to the two of them that they could not resist the swarm of pirates who were already on land. The captain rode, Loritz, uh, rode with Loritz back to the village. Once there, he went straight to his ship and bashed a hole in their hull so that it would sink. He opened all the ports so water would flow in more freely. He then cut all the ropes so that the ship might drift free. The captain then hurried to the cannons in the harbor and drove a nail into each, spiking every one, so that if the pirates should overtake them, as happened, they could not make use of the cannons. When all this was done, they saw the Turkish pirates come rushing from the south, shouting and screaming and waving red banners. Then it came to the Danish merchant's mind to escape to the mainland. As it happened, there was still a large fishing boat left floating in the harbor. Other sources tell us that this was a ten-oared fishing boat. The merchant boarded this vessel with all his household and set off. The captain, when they passed him, did not want to abandon his ship, though he gave his crew leave to go. They all leaped into the ship's boats, ship's boat and made preparations to escape to Kletsnef. As the Danish merchant drew away, however, he became greatly upset because the captain was left behind alone, and he returned. By now there were shots coming from the Danish houses. The captain leaped aboard the small ship's boat, and the crew rowed the vessel in which the merchant Lauritz and his household waited. They then all rowed away as fast as they could towards the mainland in the fishing boat because the Turkish pirate ship by then was approaching the harbor. When the fishing boat came to the sheltered harbor on into the open sea, they almost perished, for the wind blew strongly for, uh, so strongly from the east that they were nearly swamped. They only saved themselves by bailing the seawater out of, uh, with, their, <laughs> with their caps. 
By taking a great risk, they came to the mainland about 9 o'clock the next morning, losing their oars and other things when landing. Now I'll describe... So that's the, uh, the Danish house. Now I will describe the behavior of the murdering pirates, those wretched dogs. First, they scattered around, uh, around all the islands so that nobody should escape. When they came to the town, they drove livestock and everything before them to the Danish house at the harbor. That part of their force, which on the way to the town, came to Landeskirke Church, surrounded by the church, uh, surrounded the church, shooting and hewing it with axes until they broke in. First they stole the vestments and dressed themselves up. Then they trooped away from there, driving everyone they captured towards the Danish houses. Those who could not move as fast as the pirates wished, uh, they beat to death and left lying behind. So bloodthirsty were they that they turned back to hack and strike the dead for the sick pleasure of it as will be described more precisely. In the inhabited district, they came to Ofenleti Steading, where they captured Reverend Olaf at Eggleston, along with two maidservants and a baby. When the priest tried to resist, they kicked him and struck him, as he comforted himself and uh, said that such things he would not have to suffer in another world. They became furious and beat him and his children violently, driving them towards the Danish houses. Before they left off uh, Ofenleti, they first went to Ofenleti Farmstead, which they, sought, which they sought so closely for captives that they lit torches and searched in every house. When they found one old woman hiding atop a pile of firewood, they lit a fire and pulled her off and brought her to Ofenleti, where they left her lying on the grassy slope in front of the farmhouse, while they continued to search around about. When the eleven-year-old son of Reverend Ilifer Il- Eggleston came by, all unsuspecting to see his parents, the pirates captured him at once and tied his arms behind his back. He too was left outside the farmhouse. The boy asked the old woman to untie him, but she said if she, that she dare not do it. When the Turks came out from searching the farmhouse, they checked to see if he, he was still tied. They captured two other children of about six years old, whom Reverend Olfer had taken in. When all this was done, they drove everyone, children and adults, towards the Danish houses. Then they began to set fire to the island's houses. There was a woman there who could not walk, whom they had captured easily. Her they threw on the fire, along with her two-year-old baby. When she and poor children screamed and called to God for help, the wicked Turks bellowed with laughter. They stuck They stuck both child and mother with sharp points of their spears, forcing them into the fire, and even stabbed fiercely at the poor burning bodies. The Turks searched in every corner and every hole, they rooted about everywhere, like boars, and no rock or cliff stopped them, as the following example proves. Using ropes, they climbed up to the caves where the fishermen kept their fish, a height of no less than 100 fathoms. From those caves, they fetched women and children and ma- made them climb down. Those whom they could not capture without a problem, they shot to death. Some of those whom they shot fell from the caves a 100 fathoms, some 60, and some were left where they had been shot, looking as though they were alive. Among those who crossed the path of the pirates was a man named Bjarni Valdson, who tried to run away. They struck him across the head above the eyes and killed him. When his wife, who had been fleeing with him, saw this, she at once fell across his body, screaming. The Turks took her by her feet and dragged her away, so that the cloth of her dress came up over her head. Her dead husband they cut into small pieces, as if he were a sheep. They took the woman to the Danish houses and threw her in with the rest of the other prisoners. They also chased a pregnant woman who ran away from them as fast as she could until she lost her baby and fell down dead. The two parts of her separated. Ugh. The other priest who lived on the islands, Reverend Pastor Jon, fled with his family, wife and daughter, sons and servants to seek refuge in a cave. He started to read to his people from scripture to comfort them. But as he was doing this, he heard the pirate's footsteps and said to his wife, There come, Margaret. As they were talking, the bloodthirsty pirates entered the cave, and when they saw Reverend Jan, one of the pirates said, Why are you not home in your church? Jan replied, I have been there this morning. The pirate said, You will not be there tomorrow. He then struck poor Jan a blow across the head. Reverend Jan stretched his arms and cried, I commend me to my God. The pirate struck him again, and Jan said, I commit me to my Lord Jesus Christo. Jesus Christo. His wife crept to the feet of the murdering pirate and held fast to him, thinking that she could sway him from his violence. 
But there was no mercy. The pirate struck a third blow, and Reverend Yon said, It is enough, Lord Jizu. Into your hands I commend my spirit, and died. Then the pirates drove the people of the Danish uh, to the Danish houses. But one hole, one small hole, was up in the rock above where this happened. Two women hid themselves there, and they heard and saw these these tidings. This, uh, there's a note here. This is in fact an accurate. Uh, in fact, an accurate rendering of these events rather than an apocryphal story. It remains to be explained how these Turkish pirates should be able to speak intelligibly to the Icelander, especially since the Corsairs needed a German speaker to converse with Reverend Olafur uh, when they interrogated him aboard their ship. One possible explanation is that a, uh, it was a Christian renegado who, knowing Icelandic or possibly Danish, could banter thus with Reverend Jan before murdering him. Another possibility is that this story is simply nascent hagiography. As with other aspects of the Turk journey, we will likely never know for sure. He continues. Up on the cliffs above Ofenleti, the pirates found five stout men whom they fell upon and captured. One of these men was unmanageable and did not want to let them tie him. Some of the pirates wanted to kill him because they said that they did not want to be delayed. They then caught sight of two girls. When they chased after these girls, they passed over a hill so that one of the girls managed to evade them and return to the bound men. As she approached them, one of the men implored her to untie him, which she did in a hurry. After that, one man untied another. When the pirates returned to fetch them, the men ran off as fast as they could, not daring to look back, scattering all directions until they did not see each other. The distance was long, so the Icelanders could climb down the cliff and seek hiding places there. When the pirates turned back from there, one of them discovered a woman. He took her in and lay with her by force. Then he found a horse and rode with her to the Danish houses. So he raped her. One man, Erlander Runolfsson, uh, they drove off the edge of a very high cliff. They took him and stripped him and put him there as a target on the edge of the cliff. They then shot him to death so that he fell 100 fathoms. In many places, women lay dead, some stabbed, some cut into pieces in front of the farmhouse doors, left there so disgracefully that their clothes were hauled up to their necks so that they were nakedly revealed where they should not be. One man named Asmus was in his bed ill. The pirate struck him so many times that his bedclothes became red with blood. One of the room, uh, once the tumult of the capture had subsided, the Turks uh, started to select from the people imprisoned in the Danish houses like when fat sheep are chosen from a fold, and to drive them to the ships. Since the Reverend Olaf Regelson was growing old, and the pirates saw that he was not physically strong, their main, uh, their main captain wanted to leave him behind. But when his wife heard this, she asked him for God's sake not to leave her. He said it shouldn't be that way. He said it should be that way, and that he would suffer along with her. The captured people were squeezed so closely together in the Danish house that one young boy managed to crouch down and crawl in between their legs and slip through, slip through a door and escape, and he has been able to tell us how these events occurred. What happened to the old people who were there and not known with assurance is, is, is not known with assurance. It's thought that many were destroyed by fire, for once they had selected their prisoners, the pirates set fire to all Danish houses and burned them to ashes, along with everything that was in them. After the pirates' departure, dead people's bones were found in there, and roasted bodies. In total, the Turks captured well over 200 people from the Westman Islands, but how many more were beat or shot to death, people do not know. Just under 30 people have been buried. Five persons escaped back ashore after the pirates had captured the island's inhabitants, but the pirates recaptured two of them after they returned to the land, which the pirates would have done to everyone if those remaining free had not been able to hide themselves thanks to God's care. Those who escaped capture and lived there, and lived, have told about how the pirates dealt with the Danish people, which was straight after the pirates came to the islands. They put 232 people in irons altogether, but the Danish people had always prayed to God for help with the Icelandic people. And at last, when the pirates went, uh, went to leave the harbor, it was seen that dead bodies were floating by their ships, having been thrown overboard by the Turks. So, no, it's a note here. Klaus Eilfsson seems to be implying that the Turkish corsairs specifically targeted the Danes, killed them, and tossed their bodies overboard into the harbor. 
It seems unlikely. The Icelandic text is unclear, though, and it's not certain what exactly he means. And this is the final page. Before they departed, the pirates returned to the Landskirka church and set fire to it and burned the building to ashes. I cannot truly record here with any justice the disgraceful events that occurred, save to say that no such terrible thing has ever been done, neither abroad nor within Iceland, to a defenseless and harmless people, not even perhaps in the destruction of Jerusalem. What else is there to do but ask God for mercy? It says, This is Klaus Ilsen, Lorette uh, Mother, member of Logreta, written in July of the year 1627. It says here, Klaus Ilsen, 1584 to 1674, who lived in Hulmar Ilandiar, in southern Iceland, was a member of the Legreta, the legislature of the Icelandic parliament, and a uh, Leixagnari, deputy sheriff for the Westman Islands in 1635. His father was Eilfur Egelson, brother of Reverend Olfur Egelson. Hmm. As can be gleaned from the text, Klaus Eilfsson wrote his report in July 1627, very soon after the Turkish raid, based on accounts from first-hand witnesses. So that would make him, so his father was Eilfur Egelson, who's the brother of Reverend, so that means he was the nephew of uh, Olafur. Very interesting. And uh, I'm going to call that, so next week, well next time I start anyways, we'll be on to Guthreder Simoner Daughter which is a uh, another letter of the events and uh, I wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.